This is this is all right. Let's um let's pick up where we left off. So a couple of things to announce. One, of course, exam Friday, twenty five point uh, multiple choice like last time. Um, come in, take it. I'll have coffee. Leave once you're done. Uh, take home is up and available. There's three. There are three questions. The first has two subparts. The second has three subparts, um, and then the last one has none. The last one is meant to do with your, or you should be doing it with your partner. So, uh, and that, what I mean by that is partner for the phage projects. The one of the things I was going to do, but again, I, time has been running out on this project faster than I wish it would, but. Um, I want to get kind of a progress report. And so to incentivize you working on this, I figured that no better way than to actually make it just part of the exam instead of another assignment to do. Um, so for this particular one, what I want you to do is with your partner is to put together basically about a page of information. And what I want you to do is start spending time with how to analyze your results and to describe then for me where you're at, where you're going with it. Um, Monday next week in class is meant to be a work day on these projects, so do take a look ahead of time so that you're coming with specific questions that you want to ask. Um, depending on how we're progressing, I may throw in one more work day on this in class to... Um, to spend some time with it. But I do want to make sure, um, one other thing I should mention real quick, this ta that take home part, you can give, you can send me a copy to peer review. Okay, so for that last question, if you want me to peer review it or something like that, that's perfectly fine. You only get one shot at it though. So make sure you're sending me something good to look at or something you feel comfortable with instead of something at the beginning steps of the process. Annie. Say that's just part three. Yeah, that's just part three of it. Um, let's take a quick temperature of the room. How are people feeling right now? Overwhelmed? Underwhelmed? <laughs> Overwhelmed? Should we just make the take-home partner all together? No? Okay, we don't have to. I do. <laughs> if you want to, we'll make this an option. Okay? If you would like the take home to be a group. You know what, Paige? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I am overwhelmed this semester too, and I am more in tune with you guys than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> um. If you want to do it with a partner, you're welcome to. If you want to do it individually, you're welcome to. Uh, again, like last time, you have the option to type or to talk it out. Okay, so if you want to videotape or if you want to just schedule a time with me to talk for an hour about the exam, that's cool. Oh. Yes. So, um, so I will leave those up to you as options. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that for now, okay? Uh, any questions on that? Do next Friday. Do next Friday, okay. Do you want um, the submission that you look over at a certain time? Just to give you Gosh. Time? Get it to me by Thursday, like <laughs> Thursday night. noon. Okay. If, if I can get it by noon, I'll be able to look it over before sure. the evening. Next Thursday. Yeah. Next Thursday. Next Thursday. Um, then I should be able to take some time to look over them. Yeah. All right. Um, back to Ebola. All right. So um, where we left off last time was discussing... Um, basically discussing the outbreak in 2014 and 2015. And um, we talked about a number of things that contributed to this outbreak. So we talked over, we talked about, for example, this idea of um, spillover theory where uh, infection 
uh, or the interaction between humans and the environment have led to increased number of opportunities for disease to go from the reservoir being bats into a human population. We talked about that the Ebola virus itself spreads through direct contact. Uh, it has to be between fluid and blood of two individuals. And that we said the R sub naught value is pretty low in comparison. And that R sub naught value, again, is a description of how, uh, how many people become infected from one individual. And the number there was two. So for every one individual that's infected, they're going to spread the virus to two others. This is really low when we compare it to other diseases like influenza, which is around 4 or 5, measles, which is at 16. Uh, and so Ebola, though we consider it to be a relatively a, a very scary disease in terms of the mortality rate, it doesn't spread all that fast um, or, or much between individuals. Uh, I'm just going to kind of skip towards the end of these real quick. And the last thing that, it, one of the things that we want to think about is then what were the contributing factor, other contributing factors to this outbreak? And we talk, commented on things like funeral practices. Um, so uh, kissing the body or washing the body before a burial, it can lead to transmission. Um, unprotected healthcare workers, lack of protective per, or personal protective equipment or PPE, lack of bleach and other disinfectants actually are thought to have contributed to the outbreak. And then there's a lot of fear that surrounds it as well. So there are a number of stories, not only from this outbreak, but from the 95 outbreak too, where individuals um, were actually running away from doctors because, well, a person goes to a hospital, they oftentimes end up dying in the hospital. And so hospitals and doctors were looked at with quite a bit of fear as a result of these outbreaks. Um, and that led to a lack of information spread. Um, other issues, we said health care at the time in 2014 and 15 was relatively poor in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and in... Uh, Liberia, these were countries that were coming out of civil wars, and so the infrastructure was pretty poor, as was communication of information. So those are a number of different social, cultural, uh, environmental issues that have all, and, and medical related issues that all contributed to uh, the spread of the 2014-2015 of the outbreak. What we're going to begin to look at then is the virus itself. Okay, so somebody described to me the structure of this variant. Helical. What else? Not only helical, Envelope. enveloped. Seven structural proteins. Okay. Um, GP is the glycoprotein. This is on the outside of the envelope. Likely function. Attachment. This is our receptor, or spike, sorry. Um, we have the most abundant protein is the nucleoprotein, or the NP. This, is going, this actually is what creates the um, helical shell itself, so this would basically be our protomer. We have a number of other proteins like DP35, which is a RNA polymerase cofactor, and actually we're going to talk about it in the context of um, innate immunity as well. L is the polymerase. What kind of polymerase is this? RNA dependent. Yeah, RNA dependent, RNA polymerase, because what is the genome for Ebola? Minus single stranded. Minus single stranded RNA. Um, we have the matrix protein, which is known as VP40. This kind of brings together the cell envelope or, or membrane to the nucleocapsid, and it's going to help in the process of budding. We have another minor matrix protein known as VP24, and then a transcription factor known as VP30. Um, 
some images you'll see depicted uh, maybe multiple forms of GP, sometimes noted as GP1 and GP2. There's also an SGP. Uh, and we'll try to bring up the context of these, and the, or we'll bring up these different features in the context of the viral infection. Just go back to our host hurdles real quick. So there's three that we'll, we will um, consider this time around. Availability of proteins, supporting viral replication. Obviously, as we just said, it said this is a negative single-stranded RNA virus. Therefore, it has to have its own polymerase. That's a must. Because it's negative, it also has to have its polymerase present as a structural protein. In other words, it has to be present as the vir viral particles coming into that cell. If not, we can't get any transcription of this, or sorry, transcription or translation of the genome. Uh, the viral mRNAs have to be compatible with the ribosome, and in fact, what we will find is that the mRNAs of Ebola virus look a lot like eukaryotic mRNAs. They don't have introns, but they do have similar five prime structures and poly A tails as well that are made, but are made in a slightly different way than eukaryotic poly A tails. Um, and these are going to be monocystronic mRNAs as well. So we'll talk about how does the virus actually produce those. And then finally, competition for the ribosome becomes an issue as well. We're not going to go into this in too much depth. Um, it, it's actually incredibly complex with Ebola, so we're going to avoid some of the complexity and focus on something that we've talked about before, which is the fact that double-stranded RNA can induce an antiviral response and block translation of cap-dependent uh, mRNAs, or block cap-dependent translation. And we're going to talk about how does Ebola actually prevent that repression from taking place. Okay, and there will be a couple of examples that we'll see. So here is that genome. Monopartite, linear. Um, it's got what we call a three prime leader sequence and then a trailer sequence on the five prime end. Obviously, when this get, becomes transcribed, then this will be the five prime end and the three prime end will be located over here. And so, oftentimes, this genome is going to be shown in the three to five direction just because when the protein or when the mRNAs and the plus strand are made, this is the five prime to three prime direction of these that we'll see. Um, which did I say is the most abundant of these genes? GP. Not GP. NP, yes. Note where it's located. So when this becomes made, NP is going to be at the five prime end of the genome or of the plus single-stranded mRNA. What's on the, at, towards the end? I'm sorry, what did you just say? NP is going to be the most abundant, yeah. and when the plus single-stranded is made, that NP is going to be at the five prime most end of it. Which protein is probably made at the least amount? Or which one might we need the least of? What's that? The Probably the polymerase. Probably only need one, maybe a couple copies of the polymerase per genome, right? Most of these other ones, at least in the image we saw, um, for example, this GP protein is going to become part of, it's going to be studded on the envelope. We've got major matrix protein, minor matrix protein, and then a couple of others. What we actually find here is that the orientation or the order of these genes is actually going to dictate their expression. So we've talked a little bit about how do viruses control expression of certain genes. How do, how does um, bacteriophage, how do bacteriophages like, for example, T4 determine which genes are going to be immediate early, early or late? What are the features we would look for? You asked me about this somewhat yesterday. Like based on, it's like coordinated with our life cycle, so depending on where it is in the life cycle of 
biosynthesis. Right, and which controls when, which ones are expressed oh, early the or immediate early? Four promoters and sigma D. Yeah, so the, the sigma factor or the, the, the what's recruiting that core polymerase to those different promoters is going to regulate which genes are considered to be immediate, early, early, or late. With HPV, what mechanisms controlled when genes were expressed? Or what contributed to gene expression? Cell differentiation was definitely a part of it. What else? Go ahead, Grace. Was it the like expression of the antihounds and stuff like that, or is that something you told That me? would be part of the. Uh, that would be more part of the bacteriophages. Oh, okay. w one of the things we said is E two is involved in alternative splicing. And the different splicing factors, when they're expressed, which is a result of differentiation control, which genes are going to be early versus when the late ones are expressed. Here we see a slightly different mechanism. It's going to be based on the order in which they appear in the genome. Okay? So viruses have a way to control gene expression, which are going to be the most abundant, which are going to be the least abundant. We'll come back to that. Um, probably next week on Wednesday. A um, couple of things about GP real quick. Here's showing the GP1 and 2. This is actually made as a single protein, but it undergoes a cleavage step within the endosome. Okay, so this is an important part of the uncoding process. SGP is an alternative form of GP. The S stands for soluble. Um, we've actually seen something like this in a paper that we read, and so this actually will be involved in preventing an immune response. And so we'll come back to SGP later on, but know that GP itself is the, is the major spike protein. So here's one more image of the virus itself, um, and then the functions of these different proteins. This is not an exhaustive list. In fact, we find that some of these proteins are multifunctional, and that is something that we find true for most viruses. E2 is a great example. Not only controls splicing, but it recruits E1 to allow for replication to begin, Binds to BRD4 to allow for those genomes, to, for HPV genomes, to separate to daughter cells. We'll see VP35 is actually quite multifunctional. I'll just leave that at that for now because we'll come back to these. Uh, we'll come back to these in the context of infection a little bit later. All right, here's the life cycle. I'm going to stop for a couple of minutes, and what I'm going to have you do is, based on this figure, you're going to tell me the various steps of the infection. So I want you to tell me, uh, obviously attachment happens, but tell me about the mode of entry. Tell me about the uncoding process. Tell me about the biosynthesis based on just what you know about negative single-stranded RNA viruses. And then, given how this image is drawn, tell me about the assembly slash maturation. Maturation can be tough to tell from this. And tell me about the exit. Give me a description of how does it perform these various steps. Okay. I'll give you guys about five, maybe ten minutes to go through this. Feel free to work with somebody else on it. And then we'll take a little bit of time just kind of doing a holistic overview of this life cycle. <coughs> to be any attachment stuff. We'll talk about the receptor in a minute. Um, what happens after that? What's going on? What mode of entry is this? Some form of endocytosis, right? So this is saying that the host uh, cell actually drinks. That's what macropenocytosis means, basically similar to phagocytosis brings Ebola into the cell, what's happening during this process in the endosome? Uncoding, driven by what? pH drop. pH drop, good. 
During this pH drop is where we see GP cleaved into the two smaller pieces of GP1 and GP2. GP1 gets shed, GP2 is actually involved in the fusion event. We'll come back to that. That eventually escapes. The viral genome is released with the nucleocapsid, VP35, VP30, and L. That's these right here. And then what's going on in our biosynthesis? What are we going to produce from this negative single-stranded genome? Plus single-stranded, and we're actually going to get this in two forms. We're going to get individual mRNAs, each encoding an individual protein. So that's what this is right here, showing these are here, these are poly A tails. And then we're also going to get full-length plus single-stranded RNA, which serves as a template to make many, many more copies of the negative single-stranded RNA. So there's a divergence here. And replication and transcription truly are two distinct events that are occurring in this process. We'll very towards the end of this, probably sometime next week, I'll bring up what, what is thought to contribute to this transition from replication to transcription, um, as is seen in an Ebola virus infection. So we get proteins, we've got genomes. Now what happens? How is assembly occurring? That's going, yeah, so we actually, this is kind of part of the, the exit event. And actually, it, um, assembly and maturation and exit are all kind of just one single step here, if we look at it. So we start to get accumulation of VP24 and VP40, the matrix proteins in the membrane. GP is a transmembrane protein, so it's actually going to be through both layers of the phospholipid bilayer. VP40 and VP24 are what we would call peripheral membrane proteins, meaning that they're only on one face they've probably undergone some sort of post-translational modification. One of these modifications would be to add like some sort of lipid group to one of the amino acids that help to basically embed this protein or have it kind of anchored to the interface of the membrane. And at this point, these serve as scaffold proteins. VP40 is going to be involved in binding to nucleoprotein and bringing with it the genome, VP35, L, VP30. We get this budding event for exit, and the virus is going to bud from the host cell. And we'll talk about how do host cells actually try to block this budding event. Note also they're listing here the soluble GP, which is produced as well. This soluble GP will be important again for immune res or to inhibit immune response to the virus itself. So right there, we know most of the life cycle, or at least the general features of it. There's an attachment, entry is, is receptor-mediated endocytosis or some form of endocytosis. We get acidification of the endosome, uncoating, biosynthesis is all within the cytoplasm here. And they're going to incur in what we call inclusion bodies, or sometimes referred to as P bodies. Um, and then the assembly, maturation, and exit are all going to occur all at once, and that exit is a body strategy. The, well, first I'll stop. Any questions on those general features? P-bodies is a different term sometimes used for inclusion bodies. These are basically the site of transcription and replication. And we'll talk about how do you define those. Uh, it's not like an organelle where you can easily identify it. It's usually defined by the proteins that are localized to an area. So we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Grace and then um, Sabrina. With the 
It's a scaffold protein, so we refer to it as the matrix protein, but really what it's doing is it's helping to recruit NP, the genome, L, VP35, VP30 to the membrane and associating it with GP so that you have all the parts coming together to allow for this budding and exit step to occur. Obviously, this picture is not to scale, but Sabrina. Yeah, it's just the it's just the extracellular domain. So it's made without the transmembrane domain of it. So it's as if you have imagine the protein as containing two halves. There's the head domain, and then there's this membrane embedded domain. Basically, the soluble GP is only one half of it. It's just the head domain. So after, so does that just come from the GP and the membrane? It, what it comes from is actually a pro. It's it's from a ribosome uh, slip. It, or I'm sorry, it's from a mistake that the polymerase makes. So what we find. I'm going to skip ahead a few sli uh, a number of slides real quick, just to give you a quick idea of this. We'll come back to it, but this is in some of the stuff that I put together yesterday. Um, so here is what the genome looks like, and this is showing the reading frame for the soluble GP and GP. Now, you can get two potential products. Soluble GP would just be this top one. The full-length GP would be this top and this bottom right here. The soluble form is produced 75% of the time during, from transcription. The full-length is produced 25% of the time. And what happens is the there's a poly um, U tract right here, meaning there's a range, there's like three or four U's in a row. Well, the ribosome on poly whatever, polynucleotide tracts that are the same nucleotide again and again, ribosomes actually have a propensity to make mistakes there. That's actually where we most often see insertions and deletions. That poly U tract, what we find is often an additional nucleotide being added, an additional A being added, which changes the reading frame and now allows for, since you've changed the reading frame, this stop codon is no longer recognized and instead you get the full length GP being produced. So it's basically out of a mistake that's made. We'll come back to that. We'll try to draw this out a little bit later on. Okay. Any other questions? So um, there are a number of potential target cells. This has been kind of hard to define, of course. Part of that is that there's not a great model organism, which we've discussed a little bit already for this. Um, for Ebola virus to infect, for example, guinea pigs or mice, we have to passage Ebola virus in those organisms for three or four times before they become pathogenic. Um, the early target cells are thought to be dendritic cells, macrophages, and monocytes, which are all just white blood cells. They are all derived from the same uh, cell line, I guess you could consider it. Um, they're all innate immune cells. Okay, That's maybe the best way to summarize it. And these ones are ones that are, tra are cells that move. They oftentimes are not just transient, but they will move to the lymph nodes, or they will flow through the bloodstream. And that allows for, that's thought to contribute to the, the quick dissemination or spread of Ebola virus within the body. This also could explain the observation that Ebola virus can be spread through direct contact of blood or fluids between two individuals. Additional targets are thought to be macrophages, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, um, some resident macrophages, for example, ones that are located in the lung or the liver. Infection of those are thought to contribute to the organ failure and bleeding and other symptoms that we often see associated with Ebola virus infection. So in trying to identify the receptor, this has actually been one kind of controversial area. 
Um, they're thought to potentially be three or four different receptors, and so I'm just giving you an example of one here. Uh, and it is a protein known as TIM1. Obviously, characteristics of receptors would be that it has to be on the cell surface. That's a, that's a must. Um, and so I wanted to give you an idea of how they identified this. Do I really want to do that? No, I want to focus on a different part of this. We're going to skip this for now. We're going to focus on the entry step. Um, and, and it's not even important for you guys to remember what the receptor is. Entry penocytosis may require clathrin, so this may be one that's clathrin dependent, um, which is a characteristic that we talked about with some viruses. The entry requires two proteins known as cathepsin B and cathepsin L. We'll just refer to them as cat B and cat L for the for the rest of this time. This is obviously a pH dependent mechanism, and one of the things that we know about the cathepsins is that they require a change in pH to become active. So they are always present in endosomes, but they don't become active until pH drops. What they actually do is this is the pro these are the proteins that are required to take GP. and cut it into GP1 and GP2. Yep. And both of these seem to be required, as far as we can tell. There's an additional interaction with a protein known as NPC1 or neiman pick c one which is actually involved in cholesterol uh, metabolism, I think. Um, GP2 will attach to NPC1, and that will trigger the fusion event between the viral envelope and the endosome membrane to allow for the release of nucleocapsids, uh, the matrix proteins VP40, VP24, and the other associated structural proteins into the cytoplasm. Yep. So GP2 will, once this cleavage event occurs, GP1 is basically released from the GP. GP2 is what remains bound to the envelope. That's going to interact with a protein known as neiman pick c one And that interaction triggers the fusion event. And if you think about the fusion event... So if this is my if this is my endosome, and here's Ebola. Basically, the fusion event is going to be one. I should draw my nuclear protein. Oh, here's my nuclear protein slash genome on the inside. What's going to happen is you're going to get a fusion between those t these two membranes, so between GP2 and, and NPC1. And the next step of this process then, ah, wrong color. Oh, bother. Nope, don't do that. All right, erase that. So in the next step of this process, what you will get is this fusion beginning to occur. And this allows then for the nucleocapsid, the genome, et cetera, to be dumped into the cytoplasm. VP40, VP24 as being part of the matrix, which is inside this envelope, will be dumped in as well. They don't serve a use at this point, though. The main proteins that are going to be involved in the next step of biosynthesis are those proteins that associate directly with the nucleocapsid and, or, or the NP protein and the genome. So that's going to be our VP35, VP30, and L. So how do we know that the Cat B and Cat L are involved? Um, 
So here's some data from 2005 it, when Cat B and Cat L were identified as being required for Ebola virus infection. There's a couple ways you could do this experiment. One way would be to block the acidification of the endosome. And we've seen experiments that have done that. Ones where you can treat with something like ammonium chloride or um, chloroquine will block the acidification. That just tells you that acidification is required. It doesn't tell you exactly what proteins are required. Instead, what the researchers have done in this experiment is they have taken cells um, VSVG, VSV stands for vesicular stomatitis virus, and we've talked about in, pa in the past that this is a good virus actually to study uh, interactions between receptors in the attachment process. VSV is oftentimes, good lord, uh, this is a bullet shaped virus. It's enveloped in the inside. It's got its own nucleocapsid. And often I would say that VSV can be pseudotyped. So wild type VSV has its own glycoprotein that's known as G. And that's what this top bar here is referring to. The bottom one is referring to a pseudotyped form where it's still VSV, but instead of they've replaced the, the genetic information for V or sorry, for the, the glycoprotein G, and now replaced it with the genetic information for Ebola's GP protein. Okay. And that's what this bottom one represents here. So if they replace it, so with VSV and CA074 is a chemical, what does this chemical do to the to the activity of cat B and cat L. And there's two different chemicals they're using. So CA074 and FYBM cat. What do those do to the activity of the cathepsins? What's that? Yeah. As the concentration of the drug increases, which is on the bottom axis here, or x-axis, enzyme activity decreases. So with no drug, they're both active. As that concentration increases, in this example here, this drug seems to be more specific to cat B than to cat L. This one seems to work pretty well with both of them, but is more specific to cat L than cat B. Okay. So this is showing activity of those cathepsins in these two versions of VSV, the wild type, which is the square the pseudotyped with EBVs, or sorry, Ebola's GP protein, what happens to the ability to infect these cells as those concentrations of drugs increase? It go, for which one? Good. For the ones with Ebola GP, the, the ability to infect goes down. And they were measuring infection here by luciferase. They were delivering also a luciferase gene into these cells. V, VSV itself is not a, affected, right? So what that would tell us then is that the ability of these cells to infect, or at least for Ebola virus infection, it's dependent on the concentration of these drugs. And what else do these drugs control? activity of the cathepsins. So we can make a logical jump here that the activity of these drugs, their ability to block infection by Ebola virus's GP protein is dependent on the activity of the cathepsins. That's what they're arguing here. What are other ways we could do this experiment? So what are other ways that we could inhibit thepsins and show loss of infection? I don't know if 
we'll come up with any, but. Could. Anybody remember the first paper we read on norovirus? I might be the only one that remembers it. They looked at receptors that norovirus bound to. And what they ended up doing was creating a library of cells, each lacking one particular protein. And you could create knockouts. You could knock out these genes and show, hey, when, these gene, when one or both of these genes is gone, there's a lack of infection. You could short-term knock them down by a different mechanism. Um, the downside with drugs sometimes is that they have off effects. So though this is a very strong argument that the cathepsins are involved, this is something you'd probably want to back off with additional experimentation to show that Specifically, it's because of the cathepsins and not because of some artificially or other induced effect of the drug itself. Amelia? Could you do the same thing and just not allow the pH to drop, which activates those? You could do that, yeah, absolutely. Or if you knew the amino acids that were specific to the activity of these, you could alter these proteins their sequence to block that activity and show that that's required. Yeah, there's a number of ways that you could take it. Probably not any single one is the best, but it would require a combination of different techniques to perform. Absolutely. Um, why study Ebola virus this way? Why study it with a pseudotype virus? or it's at least not as harmful of an infection as is real Ebola virus. So Ebola, wild type Ebola has to be worked with in a BSL-4 laboratory, meaning full protective suit, including like the face shield, the separate air attachment and everything. Reason being, we don't have a treatment for it and we don't have vaccines and it can be relatively easily spread. Those are the characteristics of a BSL-4 organism, including high mortality. Moving it to a system like VSV, where you're just studying the, G the GP protein in isolation, this brings it down to a BSL-2 level. It's basically what we have in the micro lab. Fume hood, work in the fume hood to do the research. Otherwise, lab coat gloves, that's it. So it greatly reduces the, the chance of uh, a deadly disease. So, um, the cat one, two, or whatever, that's the, or B and L, that's the, that's an enzyme. Yep. And where does that come from? So, that is a host enzyme, and it's found in the endosomes. So, if we go back to this entry step again, we, one of the things that we said is we get GP cleaved into GP1 and 2, that's the function of the cathepsins. So without them, you find that GP is not cleaved. With them active, GP is cut into those two smaller sized products. So if the cathepsin was not working, GP wouldn't be cleaved and it wouldn't be able to leave the, or the nucleocapsid wouldn't be able to leave the endosome? Yeah, so the virus essentially would be blocked in this step right here. It would gain entry, but it can't uncoat. Exactly. Shania? You said it was a host enzyme? It's a host enzyme, so yeah. So what, what does it do for the host? Like Break down proteins? I actually don't know. I would have to look that up. Okay. The, I, I will take some time to figure that out. This is, not some, this is not unusual. We've talked a lot about viruses pretty much in isolation, right? Kind of as self-contained. And the only times where we've talked about viruses having to use the host have been in the context of like transcription or translation or replication. We find that viruses use host proteins for purposes that benefit the virus. Um, we'll see that we see this with HIV as well, actually. We'll try to bring up a couple of those examples with HIV. Sometimes viruses will usurp or use the function of a host protein for its own benefit. Trouble with that then is it becomes, it can become rather tricky to block the, block that step of infection 
without affecting the host cells in some ways as well. Right? Um, the other thing that we find is these types of steps are ones that are more, much more evolutionarily conserved because the host us goes under undergoes evolution and mutations at a much lower frequency than we find for viruses. And that's a, kind of been an argument as to why they sometimes use these host proteins too. I'll look that up though. I don't know the short answer to it. All right. Um, I think I'll finish with this thought, uh, thought for the day then. Um, and maybe this is a good place for not tonight, not tomorrow, probably like Tuesday next week or Wednesday on the bus ride in, assuming that we don't get more snow. What do we know about replication and transcription? And again, this is just kind of going back to with negative single-stranded RNA viruses, walk me through the biosynthesis. What, has, what events have to take place in order for genes to be expressed? We'll use this as our stepping stone to understand some intricacies of Ebola virus and other viruses like it, which include Marburg virus. Okay. All right, I leave it at that. Have a great afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions, send them my way. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Friday. Guys and gals, mostly gals. <laughs> No, the genome is assembled. is assembled. You have to do the any sort of annotation that you want with it. Oh, so do we just get that from you, or? So, what are you doing? What are you and Tori doing with yours? We're seeing if there's codon, uh, codon uh, bias. So you don't even. That's your guys's annotation then. Okay. Is to figure out is there codon bias. So pretty much we just. So, so what you guys are going to have to do. The first step will be to um, the first step will be to identify any of the open reading frames, mm -hmm. and then from those open reading frames, you're basically going to take that information and look for okay. codon bias. And do you have that, or do you send that to us? I will send you guys the sequence. Okay. I'm hoping it, they should have been done. Jeez. They should have been done.